I think that um, we can not only talk in terms of having the fundamentalist movement being a, a, a conservative movement in society that uh, you know is is uh, is is fighting against the visibility of women only i don't think we can look upon them like that i think for the moment they are a very very useful catalyst in terms of demonstrating that our societies are on the move and responding to various hegemonies be they those of the national elites of the state that has ha, have not by and large mm -hmm. allowed various groups and societies to speak up their minds to be represented mm -hmm. to to, to uh, simply exist in a way both as symbols and as you know mm -hmm. as practices uh, but uh, uh, they they um, they have also been uh, sort of extremely important in compelling the various regimes to either open up or enter in a, in, a, in a process of crisis of legitimacy. Yeah. I think your experience is probably different uh, uh, somewhat as a, uh, from Butena's in Iran. Do you feel that fundamentalism is uh, a civil movement or more a political one? Or? Well, uh, fundamentalism being in power, being the government, it would make it rather different from, uh, yes. you know, Butena, what, from Algeria. Uh, but in terms of w this sort of, it's really strange that the word visibility keeps coming up in relationship to women, you know. The point for me is that um, a lot of times people uh, think that uh, after the Islamic Revolution, you know, women have become more visible in Iran, you know, because now more religious women are participating in the life of society. Now, this has turned the Iranian society or the women within the Iranian society into uh, some sort of a paradox because on one hand you are there you're visible on the other hand as soon as you're visible you know you're asked not to be there mm -hmm. you know for example I can mm, teach at the university but um, I have to be there in my classes in a way that the students do not notice me as little as possible mm -hmm. <laughs> you know my face has to be covered my body has to be covered I have to talk in a way to move in a way my gestures are, should all be controlled so that I won't attract attention now mm -hmm. you know, this comes into a contradiction you know mm -hmm. with uh, my role as a teacher or as a professor you know okay. uh, for me mm -hmm. it is really strange because uh, I'm the authority figure quote-unquote mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the class and yet uh, there are these I don't know about 20 male students who mm -hmm. are the real authority <laughs> real authority figure you know because you I mean this is the first experience I had in Tehran University you know um, there was this very brilliant student of mine you know and the first two sessions I taught um, he came to me and we had a long conversation for about two hours and I was very excited I thought how bright this guy is you know and I was very excited. <laughs> so at the end of the talk I sort of stretched my hand you know to just, <laughs> and he went like this and all of a sudden uh -huh. you know I thought well you know who am I and who is he Mm -hmm. You know, because we're speaking the same language, but are we speaking the same language, you know? So you really start to doubt your own identity, mm -hmm. you know? And the ground sort of becomes very shaky, mm -hmm. you know? So this uh, uh, fundamentalist or uh, Islamist uh, movements that have come about, in fact, you believe, have brought women's questions more to the fore, made it more centralized, um, made it the... Uh, essential issue around which social problems are discussed is, is that how is that a good way to put it? <laughs> is that how? I yeah, I can say about Bahrain mm -hmm. and the Gulf region, and although they are they differ anyway, but as, uh, there is a kind of movement going on mainly with fundamentalists, mm -hmm. but women, a liberal women, a professional joined mm -hmm. mainly the movement because. Uh, uh, the quest now is for democracy all over the, mm -hmm. especially after the Gulf War. Now, how do how do how do women deal with this? That is, you have uh, women who are seeking democratization yes. and pluralism and participation in civil society. Yes, you're having them join the fundamentalist movements, yes. which are standing as opposed to or in contradiction to the state. No, and uh, yeah. uh, then. Uh, and the fundamentalists, of course, uh, basically have a scenario of limited rights for women. Now, this seems very complicated and complex. How, how, how does it work? Well, the fundamentalists uh, are part of uh, a coalition of mm -hmm. other uh, 
opposition from liberals, uh, former Marxists and socialists, and uh, they all decided that in case of uh, uh, restoring the parliament again, they will ask for the uh, rights of women to mm -hmm. vote and to be elected mm -hmm. and uh, to join, I mean, the parliament later. Mm -hmm. So I think that was appealing to most women fundamentalist mm -hmm. women, Islamist women, and liberal women. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe the, uh, the, exp uh, the Iranian experiment and the Algerian is more advanced, and mm -hmm. we don't know. We cannot base mm -hmm. the outcomes mm -hmm. on what uh, will happen in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that basically they are interesting because they're very different. And I yeah, think that's that, what makes that, it interesting. It's, it's absolutely <laughs> fascinating. Um, as I hear you speak, and in relation to what Mehnaz has just uh, remarked, uh, the Algerian context and, and experience is again different. Mm -hmm. um, when the two movement appeared, they appeared in the early 80s as, as you know, uh, movements that, that we uh, could hear and that we could see you in the, the feminists and the, fundament the feminists and the fundamentalists mm -hmm. and uh, this was in relation to a, a very uh, significant mm -hmm. issue and that is that of uh, family uh, code and mm -hmm. family law and personal status uh, laws um, the first um, uh, uh, manifestation of women as uh, a feminist movement in Algeria came up in the early 80s and that was in relation to the issuing by the state and by the government at that time of uh, a family code and um, this code was supposedly based on the Sharia. Now the Sharia is such a, a rich legacy in the, in the history of Islam with all its schools. Mm -hmm. I say rich by the fact that you know it had it never ended being interpreted and reinterpreted. Now the state comes at least in Algeria and says this is based on the Sharia because we are both a secular and Muslim state mm -hmm. and this is how the family is going to be regulated. Uh, it is understood that according to this code women will play the role of minors mm -hmm. because they will not have any decision-making empowerment mm -hmm. upon the issues of marriage, divorce, um, a child custody and inheritance. Mm -hmm. And these appear to be um, items taken from the Sharia straight away, mm -hmm. but in fact they're not. Mm -hmm. They are interpretations by some members, specialized mm -hmm. members of the elite of the whole legacy of 14 mm -hmm. centuries. So, I mean, we re really have to be very careful there. And what the feminist movement has done there is that they, they said, we do not uh, accept such a, such a law that, that uh, puts us in a, in, a, in a status of minority, eternal status mm -hmm. of minority. Uh, we do not, we're not disputing here the Sharia because this is not Mm -hmm. purely Sharia, mm -hmm. what we are disputing is the ambiguity of this family mm -hmm. code mm -hmm. that is also building upon customary mm -hmm. law and not only the Sharia which is a scriptural mm -hmm. uh, law mm -hmm. and but at the same time of course the feminists were not happy about mm -hmm. this ambiguity and the Islamists well, were even it. less mm -hmm. happy about it because mm -hmm. they really wanted to push forward the idea that we should not only uh, you know, issue a family law based on the Sharia, but the whole of the Sharia without, and uh, there they do not even pose the uh, basic Islamic principle of interpretation of ijtihad mm -hmm. whatsoever. Well, this is what's so. interesting is that uh, uh, Islamists or fundamentalists, different terms are used uh, to describe them, um, and uh, uh, they, they brought this uh, idea forth uh, that I think we all have been talking about that. Uh, women have been reclaiming their right to interpret religious texts. Uh, they have been trying to say that because we are women and because we believe in women's rights, it doesn't mean that we cannot participate in the process of interpretation of the texts on which all of the laws relating to our right lives are, are, are based. And uh, also uh, the questioning of why is it that when it comes to these issues, uh, you know, there's this lack of flexibility but when it comes to commerce or economics or mm -hmm. banking on which there is this uh, whole set of uh, rules there is uh, quite an easy uh, attitude of flexibility you know well first then the gulf all the gulf states uh, except kuwait there is no civil uh, law uh, uh, and we only uh, adopt the sharia law mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as the Sharia law, there is no uh, age limit mm -hmm. for uh, marriage. Mm -hmm. 
there is, in, in, in case of divorce, it's the uh, right of the man to divorce. Uh, so we only are asking, I mean, all the Muslim and Arab uh, countries have a kind of uh, civil law, but the Gulf states are still in the primitive stage, I mean, the initial stage, that we uh, still don't have such mm -hmm. laws. And women organizations uh, are calling for the establishment. Uh, in the Beijing conference last uh, September, uh, the Maghreb group, uh, the North African, North African Maghreb, we call them, Maghreb 95, mm -hmm. it's called, uh, com consists of uh, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco, mm -hmm. uh, proposed a kind of um, personal. civil uh, personal status law mm -hmm. that is based on human rights. Mm -hmm and it also has the interpretation of the Sharia mm -hmm. and it has more equality among men and women and uh, it calls for more egalitarian society and more rights and duties equal mm -hmm. among uh, the couples and among the children they have uh, more to the towards Western mm -hmm. I can say uh, civil code mm -hmm. And in spite of all the diversity that we've been talking about, you know, I mean, Muslims are uh, in every region of the world. There are one million, over 500 million women, and they live such different lifestyles, uh, different languages, different ways of life, and so forth. But one thing that they seem to have in common is the relationship within the family and the laws and regulations yes. and practices that, that mm -hmm. uh, relate to that. And uh, it seems that this is where most of the, uh, the uh, abuse of rights takes place. Mm -hmm. I don't even know whether we call it abuse of rights or, mm -hmm. or, or limited rights. Yes. But uh, the thing about, I mean, this woman's issue, I mean, in the Muslim world, which we keep, um, we ourselves talk about it, but apparently it has more appeal than just uh, Muslim women or uh, mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. in the Muslim countries. I think one mm -hmm. of the most important things about it is that maybe up to now, um, what we call Muslim societies, whatever mm -hmm. they are, you know, they mm -hmm. have not really seriously questioned themselves. You know, up to now it has been that you had been questioned. For example, mm -hmm. people come from the West and they interpret you or reinterpret you and they say nice or bad things about you, you know. <laughs> but up to now, we have not um, sort of uh, reflected mm -hmm. upon where we stand, how we are, who we are, and these laws. Now, um, this great resurgence of Islam mm -hmm. had to coincide with questioning. I mean, mm -hmm. Islam mm -hmm. itself. Islam, by trying to assert itself, has put itself under question, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And I think central to that then is the issue of women's rights. And I don't think that it would be good just to work on about, um, to work about and around it on a political level, mm -hmm. because politicians always come and usurp, mm -hmm. you know, everything. Okay. Uh, you have to uh, work uh, within the society to change a certain sort of mentality, mm -hmm. a certain absolutist, unambiguous way of looking at life, mm -hmm. you know. That is what is at stake, and I think that it will start with, I mean, it has already started with mm -hmm. women. Absolutely. To look at women differently would be to look at life ambiguously, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> and, and that yes. way, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, despite all the sufferings that we mm -hmm. were going through, I think this is mm -hmm. the most positive thing about it. I also have to emphasize the initiatives that are, are taken in the, some of uh, Muslim countries, mm -hmm. like Morocco, for example, mm -hmm. the writings of Fatma Mernisi, mm -hmm and some groups that are reinterpreting uh, uh, Islamic teachings mm -hmm. in a more understanding and modern way. Mm -hmm. Also the Malaysian experiment and few the sisterhood in Islam as uh, I've noticed that they have few, many books mm -hmm. uh, reinterpreting uh, issues regarding women mm -hmm. in an Islamic way because people want to uh, such issues to re-emerge from within, within. from yeah. Islam, okay. not from outside. Okay. And this movement should be encouraged, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me something, do you think that it's possible to have uh, 
women's equality and full participation and a pluralistic society within Islam. Because uh, recently, especially, there is a lot of emphasis on Islam as being anti-democracy, <laughs> anti-human rights, anti-women. And uh, I mean, I look at the text and see a lot there that is supportive of these rights, that is supportive of egalitarianism and democracy. But how is your experience? I mean, do you feel? Yes, I think this is possible. Uh, women can reach equality and uh, through, uh, as we call it in Arabic or Islam, uh, through ijtihad and ijma. What I mean by ijtihad is the reinterpretation of the uh, Islamic teachings. And ijma is the consensus, which means a uh, modern uh, concept, democracy. Mm -hmm. And reinterpretation means uh, applying the old uh, Islamic teachings to modern uh, teachings, whatever we need, whatever is needed now, today. Okay. I sort of think that you know we. I asked the question myself, but uh, I, I think that the key point here is within. You know, mm -hmm. um, I think Muslim societies uh, can evolve into pluralistic and, and participatory mm -hmm. societies in which women have an equal role. But just as in any religion, in uh, any society, you don't have to particularly place women within a religion. You can get support and sustenance from religious texts. And you can base certain arguments uh, for equality on religious texts. But uh, I don't think that, that social change can take place within the framework of any given religion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think one interesting thing that has happened is that um, Islam before now had been very exclusive. It mm -hmm. had never uh, partaken in the everyday life, mm -hmm. you know. Now, for example, for Iran, since the Iranian government is now an Islamic government, mm -hmm. since we have streets named after the imams, you know, we have an Imam Hussein street, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, no. <laughs> Islam is become. You see, before that, religion was not responsible for what was happening yes, to yes, people. For it right. could criticize the governments, but it was not part of it. Mm -hmm. Now, religion has been dragged into the daily lives. So you can now interpret mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Very much so. You know, if I, you know, tell the taxi go to Imam Hussein Square, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Then the taxi driver, who up to now has been thinking of the imam with a halo over his head, will be thinking, what is this imam? What has he been doing? Though? You know, <laughs> what happened to him? You know, all these things will come into mm -hmm. the question, and I think this is very good. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the way things should be. A lot of the youth, mm -hmm. you know, who belong to my background, mm -hmm. you know, um, they ask, like our children, ask mm -hmm. us, how was Iran before this? Because you see, <laughs> you see, because the change is not like you or like you during my time. My mother lived in a certain way, and I entered that home. But when my child entered the world, this world was not my world. Mm -hmm. And so we have this constantly this before and after thing. Like before, I dressed like this. Now the way I have to dress, and this is mandatory law, you know, I have to have a, a scarf. First of all, you have to wear dark colors, yes. okay? Secondly, you have to either wear the chador, which is a veil which comes down, or you have to wear a scarf which covers, I mean, which covers um, the your hair. hair completely and only shows your face. And you have to wear sort of a raincoat mm -hmm. uh, type of a thing, which will cover your whole body. Uh, your movements. Uh, are restricted. Um, at school, like uh, my girl students have been penalized for running mm -hmm. because that shows, you know, uh, <laughs> the contours. The gestures are controlled, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, my daughter is very confused, you know, because at home her mother, you know, is the way she is, and then uh, once we go out, her mother is, has changed her face, you know, to prepare mm -hmm. to meet the faces that she yeah. meets. 